Today on the Lazy RPG Talk Show, I'm going to do a preview of the preview for Forge of Foes, the new Kickstarter that I am launching with Scott Fitzgerald Gray and Teo Sabadia for an awesome book about how to build monsters for your 5e games. We're going to take a look at the Grim Hollow Valakin Clans Kickstarter by Ghostfire Gaming. We're going to take a look at the Black Flag playtest, the first playtest for Black Flag that has come out for Kobold Press, including their designer diary. We're going to talk about Demiplane for 5e. This is a suite of digital tools being built independently from Wizards of the Coast to help support our 5e games. We're going to talk about what that might mean for the industry. I'm going to do a spotlight for Trials and Treasure. This is the second of the three books from Level Up Advanced 5e. It's been out for a while now, but for the first time, I've really dove into it, and I really like it, and I wanted to take a look at it. And we're going to cover more questions from our February 2023 Patreon Q&A. I'm Mike Shea, your pal from Sly Flourish, here to talk about all things in role-playing games. This show is brought to you by the patrons of Sly Flourish. If you want to get access to Sly Flourish's Uncovered Secrets Volume 1 and 2, the City of Arches Sourcebook, a bunch of exclusive adventures, the dedicated Discord channel, and the monthly Q&A, you can sign up to become a patron in the show notes, in the link in the show notes below. To the patrons of Sly Flourish, thank you so much for your support. I have a new Kickstarter that is going to launch on 1 March, and this is for the Lazy DM's Forge of Foes. This is a book to help you build, modify, ponder, design, and run monsters for your 5e fantasy role-playing games. I am doing this book in partnership with Scott Fitzgerald Gray and Teo Sabadia, two brilliant designers. All of us have come together over the past year and have been writing all different top topics that relate to building, customizing, and running monsters for your 5e game. Down in the show notes, you can find a link to be notified the minute the Kickstarter goes live. When it does, you will have access to the free 30-page preview that we are putting out, but I'm going to give you a preview preview of the preview right now. This is the cover of the book. The preview covers a number of different chapters that we have there showing a variety of the kinds of things you're going to find in the main in the main book. We have the full table of contents here, so if you want to see exactly every chapter that's going on in this book, you can see it here. A common question that I've gotten is how much of it is specific to 5e and how much it is usable for other games. The answer is about, about a third of it is focused on 5e, and two-thirds of it is really usable for any fantasy role-playing game that you, that you happen to be playing. It is definitely focused on fantasy role-playing more so than science fiction, but even some of the techniques that you find in here are really universal to any tabletop role-playing game. But certainly we have fifth edition fantasy games in our in our minds when we were writing the book and a lot of the 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 crunchy bits are definitely around around fifth edition fantasy introduction we talk about why we made this book who it's for what we're what we're what we're doing it for what do we even constitute as kind of a foe because we use we use a lot of terms like monster creature and foe sort of interchangeably so we describe that here and how do you use this book what is the way for you to get the most value out of this book in the shortest amount of time first section we want to go right off with a bang give you tools that you can use right now to build a monster that for your game very quickly you can either use this to build or modify monsters very quick framework to do so gives you step-by-step instructions for how to do it first thing determine your challenge rating so we have it there's a big table in here and we just we, we talk about what all of the columns of the table mean then building a monster step by step step one determine its challenge rating step you know do you even need a challenge rating is one of the arguments you can also say well what's kind of an equivalent monster to a character level that's why we have a column for equivalent character level that isn't that is that is in there step two write down the baseline statistics from the table that you find there step three figure out which of its abilities it's proficient in what's it good at what it's not determining any remaining abilities and you're ready to go you're done then you can do that very very quickly you can do that on a three by five card and you could do it very very quickly but the other thing is to consider armor class. So we have a default armor class, but you really think armor class is more about what kind of armor the monster has. Certainly, the higher challenge rating the monster does not necessarily correlate to a high armor class. It could have a low armor class because if it's a giant you know, giant slime monster might not have a very high armor class. So you can consider the change the armor class up or down. Basic idea is like 10 is really low, 20 is really high. Then the table itself. So this is the table. It goes all the way from CR0 to CR30. It has an equivalent character level, which is kind of like what... If you were to have four characters of a given level, what monsters would be the equivalent of those characters in sort of a hard fight 
uh, what would be their challenge rating. So that's we're doing the com direct comparison of challenge rating to level in this table. That is, of course, a loose guide, and it, and it's kind of around a hard encounter, built around a hard encounter. We have their armor class and DC. Armor class and DC are pretty much the same thing, so you can use the same number for both. Again, you can change armor class to fit what what fits the story. Hit points. How many hit points does this particular monster have? What's its a proficient ability bonus? So this includes its primary ability and its proficiency in one score. It's the only one you need to worry about. And that's like what's its attack bonus or what's its spell attack bonus or something like that. How much total damage does it do in the round? This is a baseline. This gives give you an idea of the total amount of damage. But then we break that down into a number of attacks and specific damage. So that way you don't have to worry about going in and figuring out how many attacks and how much damage by, based on damage per round. We've done the work for you and said if you're playing, if you're going to run a CR3 monster, give it two attacks that do 12 damage and you're you're set and then we say what are example 5e monsters that meet this challenge rating the benefit of this is you can get a general idea very quickly about how hard the story of a monster is compared to the challenge rating so a frost giant like if you say is my monster roughly the equivalent of a frost giant then it would be cr8 if it's more the equivalent of an ogre then it's only a cr2 if it's the equivalent of you know an adult black dragon or an ice devil then it's cr14 so this is to help you take the story element and convert it back to the numbers right that's that's a handy way to have it so that whole table is there again this is in the sample chapter you can download it for free we i very much hope you will enjoy what you see here and back the book but even if you don't you can go ahead and use this at your table right away you'll be able to grab it march 1st if you're a patron you will be getting an email very shortly probably monday to get access to this right away so patrons are going to get access to this right away if you've been in the patreon discord you already have access then you can customize the attacks. You can decide, do they do some of it fire damage, some of it normal damage? These are all optional. These are sort of add-ons. Basically, you're thinking about the resolution of your monster. Maybe it's just a big blob of clay. Maybe it's got some arms. But then you're like, maybe you're tweaking out the weapons and stuff like this. So the more time you spend, the more rich your monster is. But you don't necessarily need to do all of them. Customize the attacks. Give it like maybe it's a flaming greatsword. You know, take the damage that's here. So if it, you know, we, we picked that example of the CR3 that does 2d8 plus 3. Maybe it does 1d8 plus 3 plus 1d8 fire. Right. You can split the damage types up. That fits a lot of the style. Then you can further modify the statistics, move things up and down if you want. If you want to give it more damage, but less AC, you can certainly do that. And then we have types and features. So types are what kind of monster is it? And these are all the basic 5e monster types, aberrations, beasts, celestials, dragons, constructs, all that sort of thing. And in every one of these, and Teos is the one that put this together. It's excellent stuff. So for every one of these, we have the base parameters that it has, like what are its senses, what kind of language just might have but then we gave it a specific like power like a monster ability that shows why this thing is different than everything else the aberrations might have grasping tentacles or a dominating gaze for example that would show what an aberration is like a beast might have hit and run or empowered by carnage you know two different powers there the celestial might have wings or or mirrored judgment constructs might have armor plating or sentinel you know, dragon, of course, has a dragon's breath or a dragon's gaze or draconic retaliation. Elements have elemental attacks and elemental aura. Fey creatures, teleporting step, beguiling aura. Fiends have empowering, empowered by death or relish your, relish your failures. So every one of the monster types has specific power. So you could just grab a type and say it's a monstrosity. I'll pick one of these. I'll add it to my monster. Now you got something that's really unique. So we have all of those for all of the different monster types. But then we also have some common monster powers. These are sort of general use. It doesn't have to be tied to a monster type. It makes this monster particularly unique. And that is things like damaging aura, damage weapon, defender, delights in suffering, frenzy, goes down fighting, you know, lethal, mark the target, not dead, a whole bunch of these. Now, this is just a sample of what we're going to offer in the full book. So this is the, the quick build chapter, right? Right up front, we say, here's your quick build. You, you got everything you went. However, we got a whole chapter that's just tons of these. Teos has, has put together a whole ton of these, pages and pages and pages of them. So it's like a spell book for monsters. It's going to be really, really cool. I can't wait. So then we have some other chapters that show the kind of depth that we're going to have in this book. Reskinning Monsters talks about all the depths of how to reskin, by in my opinion, the most powerful GM trait, the most powerful tool we can have in our toolbox is the idea of reskinning. This actually says here are different monsters that you might use to reskin. They're very straightforward monsters. The neat thing about reskinning these monsters is you can grab one of these monsters and then go up and grab some of those powers from the previous chapter, drop it on there. Now you have something really unique.
And that's the way this book works. It's a very modular book. The intent is that you can go from very, very fast and, and quick to, to expanding things out. You can come in from different angles. Do I build a monster from scratch? Do I take a monster that already exists? Very, very kind of grab the pieces you like and drop it together for your monster. And if you think about it, one of the things that I think really makes this book powerful, the thing that is going to make it much more valuable than the, than the cost that you're going to pay for it, is it takes all of the monster books you already own and makes them exponentially more useful. Because now every monster you've got, whether it's the monster story that you have, or whether it's the stat block that you like, but you just want to add a little something or tweak a little something, this one lets you tweak it in all kinds of different ways. It gives you all kinds of tools to be able to do it. Really fantastic stuff. What if you just want to add a spell effect to a monster? This is something I really like a really quick trick of taking a, a monster that you've got and then just adding a new spell to it i did it for and it makes them really really unique really powerful stuff so all about reskinning choosing monsters based on the story we have two chapters that show two different philosophies in how we approach our monsters in our 5e games one with the one that i tend to focus on is you choose the monsters based on the story i've talked about this all the time pick the monsters that fit the story and first and then worry about the mechanics but Teos has another approach, which is also equally valid of building the story to fit the monsters. So you have really cool monsters that you like. You have really cool, juicy effects that you like. What's the way to take those and expand those out and build the story around them to bring the characters to them in the story? Different, different angle, but equally, equally valuable. So we offer a lot of different philosophical views in this one book to bring it all together none of which are right or wrong but all of which you can kind of pick and choose from you can decide one one day and decide the other another that's great right fully expansive what are the example stories that we have here and we have little breakout boxes that say like mike notes that the act of building the story around an all an out of place monster pushes us away from the stereotypical situations the very act of having to explain the weird occurrence of a creature's existence forces the gm to come up with a creative explanation they might never otherwise thought of examples like building engaging encounters how do you make the encounter itself fun what are some ways that you can treat this so that it's not just fighting a bunch of guys in a room we have a whole chapter on that building engaging environments how do you make the environment itself something interesting we have a whole section on that and then finally the other the final chapter in this sample is building spell casting monsters what are ways for you to quickly make a spell caster version of a monster one of the one of the most challenging one of the most challenge challenging bits that we have going on here but very straightforward approach to easily make new spellcasting monsters. There it is. It's 29 page sample preview of Forge of Foes. Again, down in the show notes below, you can find a link that will take you to the Kickstarter pre-launch page. Click notify me on launch. You will be able, you'll get notified as soon as the Kickstarter is live. You can jump into the Kickstarter, find the free preview, download it, use it use it today. I hope you'll dig it. If you do, you can pick up the book either in PDF. We're going to have a hardcover version of the book, probably 128 to 144 pages. We're still figuring out the page count, but right around there. Hardcover version of the book. That's threadbound hardcover version of the book, offset printed. We will also have packages available where you can pick up all the Lazy DM books together, both in physical and in digital form. The physical one's going to be limited to about a thousand copies based on the stock that we have on hand for those. Digital copies, of course, we can, you know, you can buy as many as you want. And we also have all of the products that Scott and Teos and myself offer are also going to be available in the backer kit as add-ons. So you can add on any of those things as well. The Kickstarter goes live on fir the 1st of March. You're going to hear me talk more about it, of course, but I'm really excited for it. It is a fantastic book. We've been working really hard on it, working on it for a year. We've got a lot of cool art. We've got a lot of cool design, really, really neat stuff. And I think you're, I think you're really going to love it. Also, just launched on Kickstarter this past week is Grim Hollow Velican Clans. This is a two-book Kickstarter, both books, each book written by a friend of mine. James Hake wrote the adventure book. Sean Merwin wrote the campaign book. It is set in the Grim Hollow world, and it is all about sort of Viking-style raids on different groups and things like that. They're obviously doing very well. Ghostfire Games always knocks it out of the park with their Kickstarters. Beautiful support, you know, beautiful products. All of the stuff that I've gotten from Ghostfire Gaming looks really good. Good. Lots of different things that you could pick up, but the primary the primary set for this are these two two books. One set on the, the campaign itself, and one set on the seasons. I'll be honest. When I first saw this, the very first thing that came to my mind was, really, you want to do Viking raids? Like Viking raids are pretty horrible things. And I get. So I, I asked Sean. I said, Sean talk to me about this. Talk to me about these Viking raids and how you are handling this. What could be really, really 
horrifying subject matter in a way that we would want to play it in our RPGs. And he said, of course, we have sensitivity consultants who they brought on to look at this whole thing and to turn the language around. I actually talked to Scott Gray as well. Scott did, did a lot of the editing on this of how they tried to make sure that even in the handling of capturing prisoners and bringing those prisoners to the other clans, how that works in a way that is not quite as horrible as it would be in the real world. The book, and then Sean also mentioned, you know, we, we definitely handle things carefully when we're writing this, but also it is a grim setting. Grim Hollow is the name of the setting. This is one where we do let players and characters delve into the, delve into the dark, you know, the darkness that exists in characters, but it does not, for example, it, it, it makes it very clear that sort of any form of non-consensual sexual contact is not part of this. Any, the whole ideas of slavery are handled in a to a completely different way than they were during Viking raids and things like that. Areas like col colonialization and everything. All the things that could exist here are things that they have worked hard to make sure they're focusing on the fun aspects of this and not on the not on the, 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 the truly dark sides that many of us, myself included, do not want to play in. So high quality stuff. They have different previews that they're launching sort of every week. The previews that they've done are screenshots of what is going to be inside of the book. I understand that they are going to be launching preview PDFs as the campaign moves on. So they're so they definitely have different things that they're showing. Artwork looks like it's going to be stupendous. When we see the PDFs of the actual inside layout, we'll get a little bit more idea of the design. But I can tell you that between Sean Merwin, who's been doing design for this for 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 decades, uh, and and James Hake, who has written many many books, including the Talderai Talderai Reborn setting and numerous Wizards of the Coast books, they couldn't have picked better designers to to look at this. So I I definitely backed it right away. I'm eager to see what they do. I would probably certainly lean more on the defending villages from from raiders than being the raiders themselves, but to each their own, right? Everybody everybody has sort of their approach. So looks looks really interesting. Looks like looks like a lot of fun. I'm excited to see it go. Kobold Press released the first playtest packet for Black Flag. This playtest focused on lineage, heritage, and talents. Oh, pop-ups. Glorious pop-ups. And we, let's see, here, here is the playtest itself. It is a 12-page playtest, and the intention is to give an idea of what the vocabulary of Black Flag is going to be like, and also talk specifically about how they're handling character creation, without yet getting into classes and things like that. And there was a lot of different feedback that came from a lot of different directions on this. Some people that were on the SciFlourish Discord server said they read it and they loved it. They're very, very excited for this. I look at it and I was like, cool, right? I think this is a neat, a neat area. There, there is this question of like, what is going to make Black Flag unique among 5e variants? We saw a little bit about how they're going to handle lineage and heritage. And I like their approach a lot. It's a very straightforward approach. There's a lot of things I like about this playtest. And the idea of, I'm, gonna, I'm kind of skipping down into the middle, but lineage and heritage is essentially, if you think about your race and subrace options in the player's handbook, what if you could take the subrace and apply it to a completely different race? So you might have the dwarf as a lineage. You were born, your, your genetics are from from a dwarf so your age your size speed and night vision are all things dwarven resilience to dwarven toughness you get all of that because you your your lineage is from a dwarf but your heritage options could be fireforge fireforge heritage the stone heritage these heritages heritages can be selected by any of the other lineages. So that way you can cross match and say, oh, well, I was a human that was raised by dwarves and I was raised by the Fireforged dwarves, so I picked that up. Really cool, like mix and match sort of approach that not only handles the whole topic of race in a, in a way that seems better to me. I'm not an expert in the whole in the whole this whole this whole topic, but it certainly seems like this this breaks away from the stereotypes that you might normally find by by pigeonholing all of race and, and, and heritage into one category. But also is fun mechanically because you can mix and match things. You can you can just pick it and say, I'm a, I'm a fireforged dwarf and you're done. But you could say, well, I'm a fireforged elf that happened to be raised by dwarves. You can you know, get a lot of different mixes. So I, I like this approach. It's How does it compare to 1D&D? I, I think it's pretty similar to how 1D&D handles it as well. 
So both approaches seem to be heading in the same direction. It looks like they're going to offer different approaches, though, different different actual specific ones. So that that works well. I think I think that that will be neat. So that's a big focus they have. Then they also offer a backgrounds. One of the things that Cobalt Press talked about is if you look in the 5e SRD, the 5.1 SRD, now released under Creative Commons license, it only has one background as an example, and there are no other backgrounds. With Black Flag, their intention is to make a whole slew of backgrounds that they will release under whatever license they end up with. They're not sure exactly what license they're going to do. I really hope it's Creative Commons attribution. Like do the same, do the same license that, that Wizards of the Coast did. That's a very good license. We all know how it works. We know it's very solid. Go with the Creative Commons license. I'm a huge fan of the Creative Commons license. But the idea is there will be a whole bunch of other backgrounds that now other publishers can use because none of them exist inside the, the 5.1 SRD. Of course, Level Up Advanced 5e also has their pile of backgrounds too, which means now we would have multiple ones that we can choose from. One of the things they did with backgrounds is something that 1D&D did as well, which is essentially you get a feat at first level when you select your background. They don't have feats in Black Flag. They instead call them talents, and but it's basically a feat, right? It's, I, think they, I think I heard Celeste say that they're a little bit meatier than the feats that are in 5e. So the feats are going to be a little bit bigger Bigger. And the intent, again, is they can create a bunch of feats in here, and those feats will be released under their license as well. So now there's a big pile of feats that other publishers can use that aren't just in the 5.1 SRD. They broke down the whole I I ideal bonds motivations and everything that they had in previous backgrounds and just stuck it to your adventuring motivation. What's the thing that gets you out there going into the world? I think that's a good, a good streamlined approach. I don't really know how often all of those traits got used in, and I think even 1 d and is breaking away from them too. Then a bunch of different talents. I'm not going to dive into the mechanics of the talents. Many other people have looked at them and have lots of different specific things about which talent, like this talent is definitely better than this other talent. So why would we ever pick one over the other? Why are the martial talents so much worse than the spellcasting talents? This is why a playtest exists. And I know there's lots and lots of players who are going to dive into this specifically and look at those. That's not really my focus. And I'm not a very detail-oriented person anyway. So I'm more interested in the idea that they even are using talents, that they're calling them talents instead of feats. I want to talk a little bit about that. That idea that you get them at first level. I guess this is the new thing. I guess the new thing, you know, kind of you know, most, it seems like now we have two big groups that are moving 5th edition forward from the 2014 version of 5th edition. And they are both saying we're going to include feet like things at first level i don't know if like level up advanced 5e i don't think they do it in level up advanced 5e you could of course house rule it any way that you want if you if you do it but it definitely looks like hey first level character should be a little bit beefier for me personally i would rather they just had more hit points and then don't give them a feat at first level but you know here we are i don't think it's the end of the world I think I don't, I'm not too worried about doing it either way. Lots of people very upset about this. I am not that upset about this. One other thing that I really like that I think that Black Flag is doing that one D&D isn't doing that that the original 20, 2014 fifth edition doesn't do either is ability score generation is handled completely on its own in an, in an encapsulated way. This was something I really didn't like about one D&D. I didn't like how they moved the ability score improvement things over to backgrounds. You know, instead of just just handle it in one place, just especially for new players, just handle it in one place. And they're really, in my opinion, really close to making it right. But I, I also don't know the full story. And that comes with the standard array. I, I had talked before about the official Sly Flourish standard array. Get rid of all the modifiers. Get rid of all the rolling. Get rid of all the conversions and just pick a standard array that's 16, 14, 14, 12, 12, 8. Right, 16, 14, 14, 12, 12, 8. Bonus wise, that gives you 3, 2, 2, 1, 1, and a negative 1. Very straightforward bonus, very easy to use. You just pick it, you put them in whatever abilities you want, and you're done. Don't do all the calculations, don't do the point by stuff, don't do the dice rolling, don't do all the conversions, just 16, 14, 14, 12, 12, 8. In this one, it's really close. They have a standard array. And the intent is it already has the bonuses in there. And their standard array is 16, 15, 13, 12, 10, 8. My problem with this one is it has two odd number uh, two odd number attributes, which means if you don't have any ability score bumps, you're taking two attributes that could have been one lower, one higher, and you, you would have basically gained one. So if you look at 16, 15, 13, 12, 10, 8, if you instead turn that into 16, 14, 14, 12, 10, 8, you're really close to the Sly Flourish one. It's one point lower. I, I was actually rounding up a little bit just to give players a reason to pick it. And like, this one's better than anything else you're going to do. I guarantee you. But in this case, like 16, 14, 14, 12, 10, 8 would have been perfect. 
and it's nice and even. It, the, the conversion to bonus is really easy. You don't feel like you're wasting any points. 16, 15, 13, 12, 10, 8. I've got two odds. Now, I guess you could use those for multi-classing. I guess one of those can help you with multi-classing later, but it seems like those odd ones, they're just sitting there sucking for four levels until you get some other option that lets you bump them up. So I don't know how they're doing ability score improvements with the rest of Black Flag. So there could be a reason to have two odds to start with. I, I just hate odd ability scores anyway, right? It, it, it bothers me. So to me, like just 16, 14, 14, 12, 10, 8 would be a better standard array for a new player to start with. You can focus on the bonuses. There's, I've talked to people about Black Flag who said, why even have the score? Why not just go with bonuses? And I kind of agree with that. I'm, I'm on the side that you can, if you're making your own RPG, you can make a fifth edition compatible RPG that doesn't have scores. And it's just bonus based. And you could even have a little convert. This is, by the way, these bonuses convert over to these scores if you need them. But generally, we stick to bonuses. And that's three, two, two, one, zero, negative one, or three, two, two, one, one, negative one, right? You, you, you just do the bonuses because the bonuses are the only thing that matter. And I've heard lots of people like, wouldn't it be better if we made the scores mean something? No. In my opinion, it does not mean, you know, don't make the scores mean something. Just get rid of them and simplify the game because they don't matter, right? We already have bonuses. Bonuses are big deals. Bonuses matter a lot. Just stick to the bonuses. That's my, there's my, there's my rant. There's my rant for the day. So, but I really like in Black Flag how they combined that into just the, 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 the handling your ability scores is one section. It is independent of your heritage and lineage. It is independent of your class. It, and I, I hope, I don't know. Again, we haven't seen classes, so we don't know if they're doing something somewhere else, but it's, in, it's independent of every other part of the game. You handle your scores here and you handle the other thing elsewhere. Malin Squeeze says, how would you handle odd scores? And you don't. There are no odd scores. If you're doing just bonuses, you don't need any odd scores. I wouldn't have odd scores, <laughs> right? I would say, because whenever you have an odd score, it sucks. It's, it's, a, it's a plus bonus you're missing, or it's a benefit you could have given to one of your other scores. So three, two, three, two, two, one, zero, negative one, or three, two, two, one, one, negative one, I think are great bonuses that we, that we can use. So it's interesting to read the feedback that I've read on Reddit. I've seen some YouTube videos. There's been a lot of people who are kind of negative on this play test that they, they read the play test and they're like, meh, right? Like this is a great big meh. And I think where that comes from is that there was a lot of high expectations. I ran a poll on, on, on my YouTube channel saying, which are you more excited to see one D and D or black flag and black was like five to one over 1 D&D. People were five times more eager to see Black Flag than they were on 1 D&D. I don't know if that's still the same case now because I think when we didn't know what Black Flag was, it was everything we wanted it to be. Whenever we see something like Kobold Press, a publisher we love, is going to be making a new version of 5e, our brain immediately goes to all of the things we want it to be. And that's the one we build in our heads. And then we see what they're doing and go, well, that's not how I would have done it. I would have done ability scores differently. And then you're not as hot on it as you were because the one you had in your mind of course, is going to be better than anything anybody else comes up with because it's unique to you. And you just saw me do it, right, with ability scores. I actually think it was very smart for them to put out a play test fast because it broke that out of our brains right away. It got us to see, oh, they're not going to just take Mike Shea's every wish and put it into their RPG and, and you know, stuff that probably like, I'm so glad that Black Flag is going to be theater of the mind only. And then like 70% of people are going to be like, I hate Black Flag. Where's the grid, right? So of course, it's good that they broke that perception right away and built the expectation of what you're actually going to get from this. Because now it means we can worry about what they're putting out in front of us instead of battling with our own, the, the, the delta between our imagination and what the game is going to be. Imagine if they didn't open play test it. Imagine if for like a year they were hyping it up and talking about how great it was and doing stuff and we're so excited to see it. And then we see it and we're like, man, this is totally not what dream I had in my head. At least we're doing that right now with a 12 page free PDF instead of a full version of the game. And now we're going to watch it evolve. And now we can give feedback to the other one. This is play test and you can offer play test feedback. So that's, so that's really good. It was interesting to read Celeste's designer diary. Celeste Conowich is the lead designer for Black Flag for Cobalt Press. And she had a good, a pretty hard hitting design packet about what their intent is. And I think it really, it really kind of talks about it. The one thing that I think is probably not going to continue to play very well is the sort of anti D and D five E approach, which is, you know, look at all the things that are bad about D and D five E that we're going to fix. I think eventually you need to get to the point. One needs to get to the point where 
It's about what this game is doing on its own, not in the shadow of what fifth edition either did or what they do. This certainly, I wonder, I wonder if she, if, if she had started writing this during the design before the 5.1 SRD was in the creative commons, or like me, there's a lot of like residual angst about wizards of the coast and what they're doing with it. But I think that the, the drive of this is going to be way better than all that crap you had in 5e. It's like, well, I loved 5e. I've been playing. I'm, I still love 5e and I'm still playing it really well. I want to see improvements and I'm happy to see improvements. The heritage lineage thing, the ability score stuff, all good improvements. But I do worry that a little bit of like, you know, and so this, like we want 5.5e, not 1 d and I mean, I want both, right? I don't, I'm not against seeing what Wizards of the Coast does with one D&D. I just want, don't want it to be the only D&D. Now I don't have to worry about that. I have Black Flag. I have C7020. I have Level Up Advanced 5e. Those are just three. There's many, many other versions of 5e that are probably going to come out. I want to know that all these are going to work together, that I can steal different components from each one, that I can try them out. I can pick the one that I like the best. So I like all of them. It's not that I want just Cobalt Press's one. I want all of them, right? I want to, I want to see all of them. And she does say like, you know, 5e rocks like we all get it we all love it so but i think it's more important to f- in my opinion you know no one's asking me but in my opinion i think it's more important to focus on what black flag is doing for 5e that's cool instead of using it as a antithesis of what D has been like or where they're going with theirs that's i'm more interested in seeing in seeing that kind of thing one other thing that caught my eye when i was reading through black flag and talking to other people about it is that it changes a lot of the standard 5e vocabulary that we're used to my initial reaction was are they changing the vocabulary to try to stay away from having to use anything associated with 5e because one thing i noticed with this is that the playtest document itself does not use the creative commons license for the 5.1 srd that it, it, it it's copywritten on its own but it's not using anybody else else's license now as a playtest document i don't know how much you have to worry about that kind of thing anyway but i also noticed that a lot of the terminology a lot of the phrasing that's used things like night vision instead of dark vision or talents instead of feats and a lot of specifics about save versus saving throw i thought like is this because cobalt press is specifically trying to break away from using the vocabulary of 5e to be safe when in my opinion you don't need to be safe anymore you can put in the creative commons license and use the exact vocabulary that's in the creative commons version of the 5.1 SRD. So that was something that I was I was kind of worried about because I felt like I've already heard that Level Up Advanced 5e is also going through an approach of cleaning up A5e to remove a lot of the specific language so that they can release it without any other license other than their own. And again, I was like, do you need to do that? Like you can just include two sentences in your product and use the exact language that's there. And why would you want to use the exact language to ensure a ensure backward compatibility, but also to help our brains digest the things the same way we're used to digesting them. So when I see like save to saving throw, not a huge deal, but I have to do a tiny little bit of conversion in my head when I see that. If I night vision to dark vision, like if it's the same thing, just call it dark vision. That way, if I have dark vision in one game, dark vision in another, if I have a monster with dark vision, I have to do kind of conversion, especially if it's close, but not exactly the same talent to feet. If they're just feats, in my opinion, call them feats, right? And to me, I felt it felt like it was avoiding the nomenclature. So I approached Celeste. I asked her and I said, are you are you guys doing that? Are you changing the vocabulary to try to avoid having to use the phrasing that's in the 5.1 SRD so that you don't need to use the SRD? So I talked to Celeste and asked her if that was the reason. Like, is the vocabulary changing because we're trying to stay away from standard 5e nomenclature to avoid any kind of legal issues? And that way we don't have to use the 5.1 SRD at all. And really two sentences and you can use everything you want from the Creative Commons license. She said, no, the reason that they have made the language the way they made it is to try to make it as easy as possible for players to be able to parse it, to speak more naturally. So like players a lot of time use the word save instead of saving throw. So we can just use save. She said that night vision and dark vision, there's actually a difference that night vision, there's there are different sort of ranges of vision and that there's always confusion about dark vision being essentially like perfect see in the dark all the time where we know those of us who have dove into it recognize that night dark vision is not i'm already mixing up that night vision is not based on that so from from her from my conversation with her it was not the the language isn't changing because of legal issues because i was like we don't want to have a game's design based on law 
right? We want the big games designed to be good based on good design. And and I didn't bring that up to her, but you know, the point was that that the, the language that's being used in here is being used very deliberately to try to make it as easy as possible for new players to understand and to speak in a natural language. So whether that is the right approach or not, we'll have to see. I still think like if there's already a nomenclature for it, as much as possible, we should stick to the nomenclature. But I've been doing that in my own design. I've, I've, I've held that philosophy a lot. You know, when I work with Scott Gray, who has done, he did editing on the Monster Manual, for example, when, and he works on my books. And when we talk about that, we try to use the exact same language whenever we can to make sure that we don't, that, that people's brains don't have to shift. They don't have to shift tracks in order to understand what we're talking about. So I don't know if it's the right approach, but at least the approach isn't we're only doing it to avoid having to use the Creative Commons license because it's really easy to use the Creative Commons license. So that is the first playtest for Black, Black Flag. I'm really looking forward to seeing future playtests of it. I think it's very exciting. I think it probably is good that this first one came out and it got the reaction that it got because it helps people recognize that this is their game, not our game, right? It's not going to be the exact one we want, but I also like it because it shows the menu of options that we're going to have available for 5e i now have a bunch of different versions of 5e that i can play i can play original 2014 5e i can play 1 dnd i can play black flag i can play a level up advanced 5e when it comes out i can play cubicle 7's c7 d20 so i have all of these different approaches i have i, I, I talked about forgeborn last week bunch of different versions and i can just pluck ideas from all of them and i can i can probably piece them together and build my own perfect 5e from all the components i like best of the other ones i think that's going to be really cool so i'm really excited to see that demiplane is a company that is building a tool called nexus 5e nexus demiplane's been around for a while this is where adam Bra so adam bradford was the original creator slash owner of D, D beyond before it got bought out twice i think and when he, it got bought out the second time first time he left the company and he ended up joining this company and they were working on digital tools for other role-playing games i think they were focusing mostly on pathfinder but in this past couple of weeks they announced the fact that they are building a tool called 5e nexus the intent here is to work with third-party 5e publishers and build a set of digital tools that we can use for all of these different 5e games i don't know that we've specifically heard that things like black flag will be in there or that level up advanced 5e will be in there i don't really know what it means and which systems but there's a potential here and the potential that i really love about this is that there would be a competitor to DD beyond which i think we really need i still you know i'm going back to where i was after the you know during the whole ogl thing i'm going back to my my biggest fears before that happened which was that DD beyond is kind of its own monopoly and because D&D &D Beyond is so tightly tied to D&D &D, and because it only has the material that has D&D &D in it, but because 50% of the, of the players and DMs that I surveyed use D&D &D Beyond, it meant there was a big limit on what you could use. I have started to think more about this, and I actually think that it would be bad for the industry. I'm going to make a bold statement. Prepare, prepare for a bold statement. And I, one for which I could be horribly wrong. So mark this and then come back in a couple of years and be like, look what you said. I think it would be bad for the industry if D&D Beyond included third party products. I'm going to say that again. I think it would be bad for the RPG industry and the hobby. I think it would be bad for the RPG hobby if D&D Beyond included third party products. And the reason why I think that that's true is I think you would immediately have a whole bunch of third parties that would gravitate towards D&D Beyond, put their material in D&D Beyond, and then depend upon it. And now you have an even stronger monopoly. You would have one tool that would be the go-to tool where not only is it one tool that, that where all sort of 5e stuff is happening, but also the tool is owned by the company that publishes the biggest version of those, which means your product is directly competing with products that the owner of the tool is promoting. It's a little like the way Amazon works, where if you go to Amazon, Amazon sells its own products side by side with your products. And guess who doesn't have to pay for advertising? Guess who doesn't have to pay a cut of the of the of the royalties? Amazon, right? So for Amazon, it's like 3%. It's like credit card transaction fees. For you, it's like 60%. In that same way, third-party products would have to compete unfairly against Wizards of the Coast products in the same platform when Wizards would have a tremendous advantage. Plus, because they're already this huge gravity well for the hobby, you kind of would have to go there. You can, Just like Amazon, you wouldn't have a choice. You have to go there because that's where everybody is. 
So I actually think it would further strengthen the monopoly that D&D Beyond would have. And that I don't think that that would be good for the RPG industry. Instead, what would be good? There are a couple of things I would love to see. One, I'd love to see 5e Nexus because Adam Bradford's a good dude. We already saw what he did with D&D Beyond, putting together the team that built D&D Beyond. So I hope the tool for that is really good. It'd be really great to have another character builder built on 5e, maybe using some of these other 5e variants because unlike D&D Beyond, it's not like 5e Nexus has its own system that's the dominant system. It's like, no, we, they're definitely going to be courting Black Flag. They're going to be courting C7. They're going to be courting Level Up Advanced 5e. They want these other publishers to come in. And they're not competing. They'll still be competing against each other, but they won't be competing with the core platform. And that's a big advantage. And then we have two. You have D&D Beyond. You have the 5e Nexus. You have these different tools. You pick which one works best for the kind of 5e game you want to run. Competition. And competition is good. The other thing I would really like to see is Roll20 offer a character builder outside of the game. So instead of having to load the whole VTT up in order to see your character, why can't I load a character sheet from any of their games outside of the virtual tabletop in a nice mobile-friendly, web-friendly view? And the advantage of that is then if I buy all my stuff in Roll20, I can see, I can build characters there. We could use that as a, as a separate character builder from the VTT. I would probably buy a whole ton of material on Roll20 and I would share it with my, my group the same way I do with D&D Beyond when I'm using D Wizards of the Coast stuff. I would want to do it the same way with D&D Beyond, only now it would be third party based. And just like I was saying with 5e Nexus, Roll20 does have a house a house RPG, Burn Bright. Burn Bright is not so big that it's overtaking everything else. First of all, it's an independent system. It's not a 5e based system. But clearly, Wizards of the Coast D&D is the strongest and D&D 5e is the strongest game being played. And Roll20 doesn't develop their own 5e stuff. They they bring in third party or, or they bring in other publishers, other 5e publishers all come in. So I think it'd be really cool to see Roll20 and I think I had heard that they were working on this, but I, I couldn't find anything about it. And I don't know if there's anything about it. I would really love to see Roll20 put out a dedicated character builder and character sheet, the character mancer, they call it. I'd love to see the character mancer separated from the VTT so that I could load it up in a separate window and run it. I think that'd be really cool. So interesting times coming in the digital world. Now I want to do a spotlight for Trials and Treasure by from Level Up Advanced 5e. I've been talking all this time about I've been talking a lot about Level Up Advanced 5e because they are a 5e variant that already exists. It's already out there. They already have books. I've been using a lot of it and I really like it. I haven't been using the character options as much. I've been focusing mostly on the Monstrous Menagerie. It was my favorite product of 2022, even though it came out in 2021. I didn't get it till 2022. My favorite product of 2022 for 5th for edition. Really, really loved it. And I've now been taking a deeper look into the other books too. I, I picked up physical volumes of Trials and Treasure and of the Player's Guide that they have. And I haven't, I didn't dive into the player's guide too much. I dove in and looked for some like, specific things like, oh, how did they handle Heroes Feast? Which by the way, they handled better. How they handle these other things. But Trials and Treasure, I think is another book that works very similarly to the way the Monstrous Menagerie works. The advantage of a book like this is I don't have to switch systems. If I'm already in the middle of running a fifth edition campaign, if I'm running Scarlet Citadel, I'm running Empire of the Ghouls, I'm running Light of Zaraxxus, but I want to pull some ideas from these other books, like other monsters from Monsters Menagerie or Treasure from this book or use the random tables in this book, I can use the pieces of these in my other games. And that's where like having a shelf of different systems means it's a menu of different sort of options I can pull from and use. And this, this book, Trials and Treasure, really offers a lot of that same sort of thing that the Monstrous Menagerie offers, but, you know, focused on, on dungeon design. So it has a whole, it is intended to be a true dungeon master's guide, the kind of DMG that people wanted, right? The kind of DMG that focuses on things. So it has a lot of the same topics. I know there's been a lot of attention that says like the, the a lot of people have said that the dungeon master's guides written for fourth edition were way better than dungeon master's guide written for fifth edition. You know, I'm, I, I, I wouldn't bash them. I think they're probably fine. And they're, you know, certainly people like them better. That's cool, right? I, I don't know if I agree. I definitely understand that the organization of the fifth edition 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide is a mess. I have a feeling the new one that comes out in next year, I think I have a feeling that that one's probably going to be certainly better organized. But just looking at the table of contents, we can see the kinds of things that we're going to get in here that are, are, are certainly valuable. There's a talk about player archetypes. I'm probably going to do a whole segment talking about archetypes because I'm not really a big fan of archetypes. The short of it is I don't really like archetypes because the minute you try to apply them to the players that you have at your table, they don't fit. And instead, it's better to just know what your players want. 
like skip the skip trying to put them into a bin because it, you're you could probably take all of the players in the world and bin them into these different archetypes but the minute you have six people in front of you you're outside of that bin and instead you have players and it's just better to find out what those players want and then give them that than it is to try to say oh well they're a striker so i'm gonna or they're a they're a role player so i'm gonna do the role play stuff here i i don't have to define people's role play i could just ask him and say oh sharon i know what kind of game you like i know what kind of stuff you're interested in specifically for your character it bypasses the whole idea of an archetype so i'm not a big fan of archetypes but you know lots of other people love them so i don't know Player conflicts, how do you, this is an important one, how do you deal with player conflicts? Problem behavior, safety tools, good section of safety tools. Safety tools are now a common thing we're seeing in every RPG. And they talk about all the same ones here. They talk about the X card, they talk about lines of veils, they talk about script change, all the good ones that are there. World building, how to build your campaign. They, they take the kind of general approach we can actually jump to it. They take this sort of same general approach towards world building that a lot of them does, which is, oh, there's lots of different ways to build your world. I have an opinionated style when it comes to world building. You can see it in Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. You can see it in the Lazy DM's Companion. I talk a lot about start of the characters and build your way out. But that's not the way everybody does it. When you're building a book that's supposed to be sort of general use for a thing, you have to offer all these different options. But sometimes I think it could be better to be opinionated and say, for this game, this is the way we do it. I'm not, critica I'm not criticizing it here, but what it ends up being is there's a lot of different styles and you're still kind of stuck with, well, I don't exactly know how to do this. So, but it definitely offers good advice for this, all, for this kind of thing. Encounter design, something that is drastically, dramatically improved over the way that the Dungeon Master's Guide handles it. Paul Hughes wrote this. You can actually see the same sort of system in the Monstrous Menagerie. It has the whole kind of how do you build and tune encounters. And it is remarkably close. And I'm not, I don't mean this sarcastically because Paul and I talked about this and we're like, we both came to the same conclusion of how to do easy encounter building independently of one another. And it is, you know, how do you build, how do you figure out encounter difficulty? And it's got the same, his is a little bit more detailed. You have easy matchups where the total encounter CRs is one sixth of total character levels, medium where it's one third, hard where it's one half, deadly where it's two thirds or impossible where it's equal to. And it can change at different levels. He talks about low-level adventures are definitely riskier than high-level adventures. He talks about the maximum CR is for any given monster. That's something that I haven't haven't done. Talks about like how what does it mean for a hard, easy, medium, or hard matchup. Really good stuff. Good table. This is similar to the Xanathar table, but different. Of what kind of monsters, of what number, at what challenge ratings can you drop into your game given the number of characters that are in there? Good table to do that. Way better than the the, the two dial system of the Dungeon Masters guide of trying to match experience battles. So really, really good. And it dives into the details here of what, what it means to set up encounters. I really, I really like it. Exploration is a huge section of this book. And I think it's something that many people are going to enjoy. How do you put structure around exploration? How do you handle travel? How do you offer up what you do during a journey? How do you, what are the things that they can approach? Lots of details on this. You know, lots of, of specific things that you can use, sort of, exploration based encounters and the things that happen to you how to handle supply a lot of people are really interested in like what does it mean for supplies and how do you handle supplies so that's definitely sort of wired in wired into this event different kinds of weather and how they how they affect you while you're traveling lots of really good different activities that you can take while you're while you're going through traveling befriending animals busk chronicle cook gather components, cover tracks, entertain gossip. So, you know, I offered like four in Lazy DM's Companion, like what are different roles? And I've been using these anytime I do exploration. Who's who's trailblazing? Who's keeping an eye out for 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 any hostile activities or, or dangerous things? And who's managing your supplies and making sure that everybody is staying well hydrated? You know, that those those are kind of how I broke down things, but this has a lot more things that you can do for exploration. And again, you can just grab this and drop it right into your game. You don't need if you're like, I'm playing vanilla 5e, but I just want that, you can just grab that and go with that. You don't have to move everything over to, to level up advanced 5e. That's one of the things I really dig is that these systems are not independent, that they can you can shuffle them together. You can shuffle all these ideas together and build your sort of ideal 5e game. There's a whole set of different encounters for various regions, and this is really detailed, really, really good. Different Different tiers, tier zero, tier one, tier two, tier three, and tier four for every given place. What Badlands, what do you run into? Hey, you ran into a lich in the Badlands. County Shire. What is like a, you know, County Shire exploration tier four? A Rakshasa shows up. There's a forest fire. A hill giant chief. You know, social encounter. 
So lots of different things, all different locations and the kinds of random encounters that you would have in these locations with descriptions of what they mean when they're not just a straight, a straight monster. Lots and lots and lots of them. Really, really handy, really handy thing to have. Really good to have for prep. When you're prepping a session, you can whip these out, roll a few dice and come up with some ideas. I used a similar one to this when I was running my Spelljammer cam game yesterday. I was using the one that's in the Spelljammer. And it came up with a really fun encounter, just an inspiration that you can that you can drop in. It might just have Empyrean, but you can think about what does it mean to run into an Empyrean while you're while you're exploring a dungeon. And so I love that as dungeon too. This is one that's typically avoided. Is when you're in a dungeon, what kinds of things can you face? Most people skip that. Most of the other random encounter tables I've seen skip that idea. So all kinds of regions. And then of course you have you know here are your different kinds of social encounters, very specific things that you can have when you when you run into that. The book is just packed with this. Exploration challenges. What are the things that you're going to run into when you're doing one of these challenges? They're a little skill challenging, and I think you know how I feel about skill challenge stuff. But it, they have the specifics in here that talk about what they mean in the world, and you can sort of wrap yourself around them. Again, you can sort of use them as inspiration. You can use them as inspiration to, to handle your game. And then, of course, let's see, back to our table of contents. A whole set of maladies. And then, of course, it has a bunch of different treasure. I haven't, I didn't dive into the treasure too much to see what they've got that's like different from from sort of vanilla 5e. But I think, again, good random tables in order to be able to roll up treasure for your group. I didn't dive in enough to say what's different or how much better it is. So that's something that I might play with. I might play with later, but it looks really good. So that is Level Up 5e's Trials and Treasure Book by N World Publishing. You can often get the PDF in a package with other things for, for a pretty low price. You can also pick it up on Drive Through RPG. You can find links to pick it up in the show notes below, including the hardcover version from N World Publishing. I picked up the hardcover version. It's got nice ribbons in it for bookmarking, very sturdy, thread bound build, really, really good book. So it's one that I definitely highly recommend. If you're looking for another accessory book for your fifth edition games, this is a fantastic book that has a lot to offer for, 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 Dean, for, for your 5e games. Let's do a couple of Patreon questions. Every month, I take questions from the monthly Patreon Q&A and answer them either here on the show. I answer every question on the Patreon itself. Some of them I take and bring to the show. So let's take a look at what we've got. David W. says, Ryan Dancy, in his discussion about the OGL, mentioned heartbreak systems, systems created by people that ultimately get little to no play because people know D&D and the amount of content maintains its market share. Since the OGL shenanigans, there's been a call to play other systems and many publishers are making their own systems. Everyone is saying this is great as a diversified TTRPG sphere will be healthier than what was than what was the status quo prior. Can you speak to your thoughts on this? Oh yes, I, I certainly can. My own thoughts, one can imagine a continuum of a number of systems. On one hand, there's only D&D and there's a ton of third-party products leading to great creativity business. On the other end, 100 systems which only 10 play each. A campaign setting book, only maybe one or two additional adventures. Lots of creativity, but not many products for any one system. We were more towards the former end. This seems to be better than the latter because the number of players we know that know this system you run is huge and the number of options you have for settings and adventures is huge under the ladder you have a hard time finding players and and make everything yourself not lazy i feel that cobalt press mcdm and other large 30 par- third party publishers should agree on a new shared system thus ensuring many products and players rather than future fracturing the sphere this is probably gonna be the only patreon question i'm gonna answer today because it's a big one so first of all on the idea of fantasy heartbreakers fantasy heartbreakers was an, an an essay written by ron edwards back in 2002 i had not read it before but i read it as for, for prep for this question you can find a link to the original article and basically what a, in, in you know first of all you gotta understand this is 20 years ago more than 20 years ago when this concept was was out and the concept was basically that people would take D and and they'd make only a slight variation to D that was something that they liked and then they would try to publish it and it would not go well. Nobody would buy it or it wouldn't be very interesting. There'd be lots of typos. There'd be lots of problems. There would be lots of problems with it and it would go out. And it's a heartbreaker in in the, in the in his opinion. Their heartbreaker part is because they were good. Not because they sucked or they nobody wanted to play it. It was They were heartbreakers not to the person who made it, although probably they were to the person who made it too. But they were also heartbreakers because there was really good things in there that really never saw much of the light of day because everybody just wanted to go play five, go play D&D. And I think that's kind of what you're getting to. Starting at the bottom and working the way up. So first of all, we know MCDM is not going to be working on a standard system with anybody else. MCDM is building their own. They, You can see where they're going. You can see what their divine, the design philosophy is and that's the approach they're taking. And that's probably a good one because there already are other big publishers that are focusing on the 5e space like Black Flag, like Cobalt Press. So 
I think it's fine to let some groups go in some directions and others go in another. I'm very happy to see Robert Schwab taking Shadow of the Demon Lord and working it out into Shadow of the Weird Wizard. I'm happy to hear about a 13th Age version 2 that is going to be focused on their side. The product games who does Old School Essentials has been talking about what they're doing. They're going to continue to publish Old School Essentials, but they also have a new campaign setting that's going to have its own system in it, and they're tuning that system around it, so we have another system there. So I think that there's lots of variations out there that we can enjoy, and I'm, I, I think... First of all, none of us can control it. Like, I can't make my will the will of the publishers that are going out there. Everybody's kind of got their direction that they're taking with their own RPGs. I've got directions that I'm going with my own RPGs. Like, I'm not immune to this. I have an RPG. I was working on it yesterday. So yes, Saturdays are my day off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show it to you because I, I, I want you to see it. Mike Shea's RPG. What's that like? Whoops, that's the wrong directory. I was making my own RPG yesterday. Lightning 5e. The idea behind Lightning 5e, the good thing as far as Heartbreaker RP, uh, RPGs are concerned, is it's four pages. It's four pages long. It's everything you need to run an RPG from first level to 20th level in four pages. And I have a design philosophy. It's small. You can print it out and throw it in your DM kit and you're off to the races. Players can build characters in five minutes. It uses common concepts from fifth edition so that you're used to the ideas. You can teach new players using this and then they can they can gra graduate into full 5e from this system. Gameplay is very fast. You only need a d20. You don't need any other dice. And publishers, my intent, and it already is, I published this under a Creative Commons attribution license, the same way that the Creative Commons, the, the same way that 5e.1 SRD, because my hope is I can get this to the point where other publishers are like, I like this and I want to throw it in the appendix of my 5e book so that my book is standalone. So imagine if you have a 150 or 256 page campaign source book and it uses 5e, so you could use any of the 5e variants to run this, but also in the back is a version of it that you could run with just that book. That was my idea behind it. And I've been working on this, tinkering with it. It's come from some of the ideas. I did Dungeons of Fate before. Dungeons of Fate kind of is leaning into this. I did a thing called two, One Sheet 5e that I worked on a, a month or you know a few weeks ago. One Sheet 5e is turning into Lightning 5e. So this is my own little heartbreak RPG that I'm doing because nobody can control me and tell me that I shouldn't do it. And I'm really not putting a lot of time into it. But I want to put enough time that it's actually a thing. And my hope is that I can offer it to publishers so they have, oh, look at this, really lightweight, very easy to play, very easy to run, great to grab your friends build a character on a three by five index card and you're you're off to the races hey where can we get that maybe maybe you're saying patrons of sly flourish will have access to this very shortly if you're a patron in the discord you already have access to it. i'm getting feedback from patrons some point i'm going to release it to everybody i don't know and there's lots of lots of other things to do but that's my own version of this so my point is lots of people are making rpgs lots of people are going in lots of directions and we'll you know we're gonna see we're gonna see how it all goes we're gonna some of them are gonna crash and burn some of them are gonna go very poorly i don't think that the thing that i come back to is i don't think it's that bad if you have an rpg you really love first of all if you really love it probably other people love it too it's not very likely that you're the only one in the world that really loves this one particular RPG that you think is just the bee's knees, and yet nobody else has ever heard of it, and you can't get players to play it. I, 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 I doubt that's true. I think that some of the, you know, that, that kind of gets the idea that like, well, the best RPGs are not the most popular RPGs, which is probably true, but there's certainly a level of proficiency that once an RPG is good enough and has any visibility at all, you're going to see groups gravitate towards it. So I think there are enough RPGs that people are playing that you can find people to play with. And also there's always a glut of players compared to game masters. Generally speaking, I do not think it's hard. I had a friend of mine who said she wrote her own RPG and she went to a sort of pitch your pitch your uh, group to a local game group. These are in-person players. And she said she had like 20 people sign up to play her own RPG that she made. So if she can make one that nobody would ever heard of before and get 20 people willing to play in one region of, the, of, of a city, I bet you if with a little bit of marketing, you can get people to play just about anything on the assumption that the RPG doesn't completely suck. So I don't, the answer, I think another thing is who knows Right. My predictive analysis of what the future is, is I don't know, because I didn't know lots of things. I had no idea how this industry would change three months ago. And here we are. So I don't know what is going to happen. I don't know which companies are going to rise and shoot up, which ones are going to crash and burn, which systems people are going to love, which they're not. I really have no idea. I'm mostly interested in making sure and in, and in trying to aim 
my own efforts towards making sure that the RPG hobby is strong. And what's strong is lots of different games, lots of different players, lots of people, lots of different approaches. I think 5e is fantastic. I love the 5e system. So I'm plenty happy with people focusing a lot of attention on, on making 5e a strong independent system, a platform of its own, not owned by any one given company that we can all play towards. And I think that that's, that's, that, that that's really working out. Yeah, the answer is we're, I don't have a prediction. I don't know where this is going to go. You know, it could be that everybody gravitates right back to 1D&D and, 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 and that's still 70%, 90% of the market is 1D&D. And then there's like a few groups that are playing these other things. That could happen. But it could also happen that it's like, and it kind of doesn't matter if that happens because it's like, well, that you don't have to. You can run a mixture of Level Up Advanced 5e and Black Flag and 1D&D &D and Vanilla 5e and kind of pick and choose and write your one page that says which components you're using from which. And I think that's pretty strong. And I'm hoping the digital tools support it. They already kind of do. Most of them do. The only one that doesn't is D&D Beyond. And I don't think it should, as I said earlier, because I'd be worried that they build a monopoly around it. So it's, we're going to have to see. But it's a fascinating, it's, you know, now that we're in a better spot, I'm really optimistic about the hobby. And I really think we're in a strong spot. I'm very excited about the products that we're seeing. I'm really excited to see what's going to happen in the future. Even when like something comes out and it's like, oh, that's not exactly the way I would run it. It's like, I don't care. I've got so much stuff. I can build whatever I want and I can run any kind of game I want. And my, I have players that I love who love the, the, the games that I run. What else is better than that? So... I think that's a good place to end the show. So I want to thank all of you for hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you did and you want more material like this, you can subscribe to the Sly Flourish newsletter. You get a free adventure generator PDF plus a weekly newsletter sent directly to your inbox. You can support me directly on Patreon. Patrons get access to all kinds of exclusive materials like Lightning 5e, like the City of Arches source book, like Uncovered Seekers Volume 1 and 2. Basically, whenever I'm experimenting with something or putting out a quick product, the patrons are the ones who get access to it. It's a tremendous deal. You really should consider getting on it. And you can pick up any of my books at the Sly Flourish bookstore, including Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master, the Lazy DMs Workbook, and the Lazy DMs Companion. Thank you all very much. Have a great day and get out there and play a role-playing game.